Welcome everyone to Beyond Surviving, the safe space for survivors of childhood sexual abuse to receive support, resources, and share their stories. Beyond Surviving is about freedom, healing, connection, and even laughter and fun. Most importantly, it's about letting go of the pain of abuse and finally moving on. I'm Rachel Grant, and for those of you who don't yet know me, I've been a sexual abuse recovery coach since 2007, and I am the author of Beyond Surviving, the final stage of recovery from sexual abuse. You can learn more about me and the Beyond Surviving program at rachelgrantcoaching.com. Well, happy February, everyone, and I am so excited to have with me here today, Kellyanne Parker, who's going to be sharing with us about her journey from being diagnosed with dissociative identity disorder, the struggle that then followed with the stigma and the shame, and ultimately how she broke free of that and so much more. The I want you to know a little bit about Kellyanne before we jump in. Um, she is a queer Latinx Bay Area poet. She's been living with the DID for over 30 years. So she, you know, was diagnosed back when it was called multiple personality disorder. And she's really going to be able to bring a perspective about, you know, how things have evolved um, when working with this particular challenge. And so the good news is that it was like her healing became another, you know, coming out moment for her, you know, first as a queer woman and then as someone who's living openly with DID. And this is something that I just so appreciated about Kellyanne when she and I spoke, you know, that she's just, you know, really here to help people understand and to break the, these stigmas and to be a voice for change. So Kellyanne, welcome. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Rachel, for inviting me. Um, I really enjoyed our discussion. Of course, I've enjoyed listening to your other podcasts, and I'm really grateful to have a chance to talk to you today. Yeah, thank you. You know, this um, this particular disorder, um, dissociative identity disorder, has, you know, really been very, very misunderstood misdiagnosed. Um, it's certainly been in media and films and TV, you know, um, given kind of extreme representations of what it's really like. And so what I'd really love to begin with is, you know, first of all, this moment for you of when this became a diagnosis, this became an, a way of understanding, you know, what you were experiencing. Can you take us a little bit back to that moment? Because I know for so for so many, it can be really um, edifying, like helpful to have a label and to have a name for something, but then also it can be disorienting and kind of turn things on its head. And, you know, tell us a little bit about your experience with that. All of the above. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so 30 years ago, go back to actually 1991 when I was first diagnosed and it was then called multiple personality disorder. Uh, the only reference people had was Sybil and mm. Sally Fields and you know all of the what would be memes today of that um, uh, of sort of the very you know extreme um, experiences that a person goes through um, when either dealing with amnesia, uh, which comes with uh, different types of dissociative dis disorders, mm -hmm. um, and also, um, you know, switching, which is something we can talk about a little bit more too. Um, and it, it really othered people in a lot of ways. It was a, a, a label that had a lot of stigma, mm. but at the same time, uh, once I accepted my diagnosis, which if you can imagine, I lived with, I use the word others, not alters. So living with one of my others that I was co-conscious and aware of, which I'll explain a little bit more in a moment, um, was something I, I didn't share with anyone. I finally shared with the therapist and after discussion, we were able to agree that uh, that was my diagnosis. Uh, it was really liberating because for the first time in my life, I didn't feel crazy. I knew I wasn't crazy. Um, I had something that other people had mm. and 
worked well. It was different. It was not, you know, while, and it was pathologized, highly pathologized. Um, but there was an explanation, there was a treatment, and it began my healing journey. It was uh, the beginning of something that turned out to have a lot more blessings um, than it did setbacks. So amazing. Yeah, and there, there are layers to unpack here. So the first piece that I want to come back to from what you just shared is this distinction between others and alters. Like for you, it's been really important to think about the language that you even use when thinking about this experience that you're having. And what does that represent for you, the difference between, you know, others and alters? Um, so for, and, and so for people with DID, we generally refer to ourselves as a system um, and, and some people name their system. My system refers to themselves as the collective um, and that's an internal thing. We don't necessarily share that that much outside, but the purpose of that is just to give validity and importance to all parts of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And the irony is that um, if you look at any type of recovery program, people talk about their inner selves, their inner lives, their inner children, and yeah. that's all widely accepted. But the minute that you talk about inner children, there are more Ooh, you know, right. with, living within you, all of a sudden that's an anomaly. And uh, so what, what I hope to um, share with the audience today is that, uh, we have uh, created very great adaptive skills to very extreme situations in a way that is, it, it was a healthy way to deal with a traumatic situation. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily serve all parts of our lives. Um, and that's where the uh, treatment comes into place. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about that because, you know, it's so true that whatever we are experiencing, you know, I think there's a space in which we learn to embrace our experience, embrace where, you know, challenges are and embrace in some ways, just like who we are. I think that's such a big part of the work that we do in Beyond Surviving is taking away the pathology of, of anything that we've experienced or thought or done or, you know, ways in which we, we need to navigate the world. And I'm curious, you know, when, when you got this diagnosis and then, you know, began to step out into the world and begin naming this, you know, with people in your life, what was that like for you? You know, when you first began sharing about this, what were some of the challenges around sharing and, and even just kind of living with this diagnosis? Yes, that's a very, um, that's a, that's a big thing. When I yeah. first got the diagnosis, I was married to a man at the time and, uh, I mentioned it and it never came up again. Mm. I never said it to another human being for over 20 years. Oh. I, I lived with the secret. I was absolutely certain that if I told anyone else that I would be rejected, that I would be unlovable, that I would be, you know, I just all the, all the fears that a person could have about the stigma and the shame around mental illness. Um, I lived with for a very long time. And what ended up happening was, um, a very dear friend of mine disclosed something about someone that they knew uh, that made me know that I was ready to share it with someone. Hmm. And she was not only accepting and embraced me and was curious and interested that I started putting my toe in the water and uh, later on, I'm going to kind of step forward a couple of years, but I, you know, started doing poetry performances, and I would share with audiences, um, and I, I was married a second time, and before we started dating, my, um, my wife knew about my diagnosis mm -hmm. before we started dating, and it was okay, and that changed my life forever. 
Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, when you think about, you know, I think there, there are two kind of things we're, we're working with in our conversation today. First of all, for those listeners who have DID, just helping to normalize their experience and giving them insights about how they can thrive and you being such a model for that, right? And letting and releasing, you know, shame and knowing that you can find people who are going to get it and love you and embrace you and, and all of those things. And for those people who are listening, who might end up being in relationship with someone like how can you be an ally how can you be an advocate um you know have a deeper understanding and a a compassionate understanding for you know what is really going on here um so maybe talk with us a little bit about like what's most important to understand and to know um about did um so the most important thing is that the distinction between uh what what uh i don't want to say creates or begins or whatever uh, DID in a person it is really early long-term and extreme trauma. And the definition, you know, like a person's worst experience is their worst experience. So there's no trauma Olympics. That's the one right. thing I always wanted to talk about. Oh yeah. <laughs> we talk about you that a lot win, beyond surviving. There is no that. competition in trauma. <laughs> yes. <No>. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and, and so a lot of it, it, it's just a matter of, um, you know, at our earliest times in our lives where we felt continually unsafe whether that was true or whether that was something we were made to believe, it doesn't matter. Yeah. You know, the, the living with the fear is what actually causes that. And um, so most people with DID, um, there, there's obviously PTSD is very common uh, form of a dissociative disorder where people experience dissociation. Right. Um, and then uh, often that's a single episode. You imagine someone goes to war, there's a, you know, an event, a traumatic event that happens um, and CPTSD where you know, it could be a domestic violence situation. Someone is living with ongoing repeated trauma and DID is usually like that, but it starts early on. And mm-hmm. so as, uh, as a person is developing their sense of self, um, there are other sense, uh, other selves that will handle different situations to be able to manage the trauma that you're living with. Um, and so for most people, there are what we refer to as trauma versaries, meaning that there's an anniversary of a traumatic event whether you know it on the calendar or not. And and often what I recommend for people that I know that are living with DID is um, mark it down on a calendar, prep yourself, make it a radical self-love and care day where don't make big decisions, take the day off, Mm. go to the beach, like Mm. whatever it is that can take the pressure and anxiety off of everyday living so that you could just work your way through, be in your body, be present. Um, and the more that you are able to process these things and discharge them, the, the less you hold on to them inside. And so, um, you know, for a person who's supporting somebody with DID, understand that there are times that a person might need some more support. And it might be related to the calendar, it might be related to particular holidays, to a particular family member, um, whatever that is for that individual, just to understand that there there are certain things. Um, I knew someone who uh, would be triggered and would switch when they heard the sound of um, a siren. Mm -hmm. So the triggering, whatever is triggering for a person could be very different based on their individual experiences. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, understanding the context in which, you know, this is a process of coping, this is a way of surviving. And then as you come out of these, you know, spaces where, you know, harm is occurring, finding a way then, you know, to, to navigate life um, as you are, you know, one of the things we talked a lot about and when we first met was this idea of like integration, you know, versus, you know, really kind of like being in alignment with these parts of yourself. And let's talk about that a little bit, because I know from the clients that I've worked with, 
with, you know, in the past who uh, had DID, there was there so much of this like internal pressure of like, I've got to get rid of this. That was really so much like, how do I get rid of these parts? How do I make this stop? And I think you bring a really important perspective about that. Can, can you share a little bit about what you think about that? Yeah, thank you for asking that question. Um, I was very lucky in that my first therapist was a PhD candidate who had, was part of a school of thought of the radical notion of treating um, the different parts of ourselves as sort of a family structure. Mm -hmm. And so instead of pathologizing like, ooh, like this, you don't need this, let's just strip this away or squish this in or, you know, I mean, my first vision of sort of unpacking the um, the compartmentalization that was happening within me was kind of like a, a silverware drawer getting dumped in the middle of the ground, mm, you know, it's just mm. this, with the, from this orderly thing to this messy thing. And that's not necessarily true for everyone, but um, what happened as a result of what we did, which was called internal family systems, where it's like family therapy, where it's like who needs what and who does what, and finding that, you know, there's a reason that each part of me exists and mm -hmm. they all have special talents. They, you know, some go to work, some don't. And the, the difference was having internal agreements about who gets to be in the relationship in the bedroom, who does not, you mm. know, mm -hmm. who gets to show up at work and who, you know, does not. And the goal these days is really for what's called co-consciousness, meaning that there could be another part of me that is present, but I'm there too. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, I, there are times where I can sing really well. There are times I do not sing well at all, you know, but yeah. I'm there both times. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, you know, there are different skills and talents. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. The way that you describe that, I think is just so like reassuring and so compassionate. I think it's an interesting thing for all of us to think about because we, we all hold in some ways, these frameworks of like aspects of our character, aspects of our personality. And I think we can all relate to it in some ways. Like there are times when I want to show up a certain way and times when I don't. And to have this like, conversation with yourself to decide, hey, I'm going to honor every aspect of me that's here, every part of that is here, and then assign some boundaries. And as opposed to, again, like this place of like eradicating something, you know, and feeling that pressure. Um, awesome. So we're going to take a quick break and when we come back. Let's talk a little bit more about the ideas of like co-consciousness. Let's unpack that a little bit more. And then let's really talk about the journey you went on in order to be able to be here today and just be able to talk so openly and freely about this experience, um, having navigated and released the shame that you felt about it previously. Okay, so we'll take a quick break and we'll be right back. Have you ever felt like you've tried everything to heal from the pain of sexual abuse and yet nothing seems to be really helping? Well, one of the reasons why most people struggle to break free from the pain of past child abuse is because the techniques out there are positioned as a one size fits all answer. What I want you to know is that there are actually three distinct phases on the path to recovery. And I'd love to share with you about these phases, what issues you must resolve to move to the next phase, and what kinds of support you'll need in order to move forward as quickly and completely as possible. The road to recovery is much easier when you know what stage you're in and what to do next. So don't hesitate, go to rachelgrantcoaching.com slash checklist and get your nine page guide today. Now back to our show. Welcome back, everybody. So Kellyanne, uh, already, I'm just, you know, so 
honored and appreciative of everything that you've been sharing with us today about what it's like to live with dissociative identity disorder. It's such an important topic. It's something that we, I feel like we would just have to keep shining a light on. You know, I, we talked a little bit about how almost like there are like these acceptable, like there was over here, we've like made progress and like mental health awareness and like, yes, you get to be that, you get to have that, you get to struggle with that. But then there are these other experiences that are still like, oh, you're on the edge and I don't know about that. So the more we can really bring consciousness and awareness and conversation, you know, around this, I think is just super important. When you think about your journey, um, you know, we talked a lot about how, you know, there's so much stigma and so much shame. So how did you really go about unpacking the shame that was there for you and being free of it? That was complicated. It took me, um, as I said, 20 years before I actually openly shared it with the people close to me in my life. Um, it was over 20 years. And um, what ended up happening was that I could no longer, uh, you know, just as um, I became very visibly open about my queer identity, I realized that there were you know, many other parts or sides of myself that I was trying to fit or conform into. And I, um, you know, being a, a poet and doing a lot of poetry readings, I found a lot of like-minded individuals and mm -hmm. you'll find in the arts community, you know, we're a quirky lot, but in the best possible way. Yes. And, and you know, basically you're you're finding people who also embrace their unique their uniqueness uh, in a really wonderful and 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 express it in a wonderful and beautiful way. And so finding my people, you know, had a lot to do with creating um, a place of safety. And I remember the first time I went to an open mic um, where I shared my identity, um, my DID, um, the week before someone else had gone up and done it. Oh. And it was someone who lived very openly and did you know, lots of public speaking and that sort of thing. And I, I had to do it. I had to do it. I waited a week. I agonized over it. I was like, I was sick to my stomach. I was anxious. Mm. I was jittery. I was, yeah. and I knew I had to do it. So um, I went back the next Tuesday, got up and was shaking, thought I was going to barf on the front row. <laughs> right on. Fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> I feel that. <laughs> yeah. And, and I got it out. Amazing. And the room was full of like acceptance and mm -hmm. love. Mm -hmm. And I realized I want more of that. Yeah. I want more of that. And it gave me the courage to begin to share more to where I was in audiences of people I didn't know mm -hmm. and I would share it. Um, and then of course, you know, more recently with my book, um, it, it did, uh, originally, um, so I have a poetry chapbook coming out called Down the Foggy Streets of My Mind, and um, it is about my DID and what it's like to live with dissociation. Um, but as, um, as I was finishing with my editor, I was alluding to my diagnosis, and then I was putting it back in, and I was taking it out, mm. putting it back in, putting mm -hmm. it out, like going back and forth, and the thought of uh, putting it in print where I didn't control who got to see it um, was terrifying. Yeah, it's a big step. It was a big step. And um, I did it. And then I shared my diagnosis with my boss. Not everybody can do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was totally understanding and didn't see any weirdness about it. And uh, I... I you know, it was for anyone who, you know, identifies as LGBTQ knows what coming out is. Some people come out with a big grand, you know, balloon. <laughs> yes. And other people are like toe in the water, like yeah. these people know and these people don't. And um, and so my journey of, of being openly DID was a little bit of that. Like, mm. you know, I had mm. some people 
people who knew and some people who didn't. And yeah. I would feel the situation out before I would share. Um, and yeah. uh, I and, and I no longer do that now. Now it just comes out. Like, yeah. here I am. Yeah, take it like, or leave it, baby. Take it or leave it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah right and for all of you out there wondering like how do I get rid of shame there are layers of things that you can do but I find almost always like the the key piece to the puzzle is speaking about it to someone yeah. having that experience witnessed you know shame like Brene Brown says you know lives in the shadows lives in the silence and when we begin to speak and tell our stories and then exactly, I love what you're just modeling here. Like you try, you start out in a trusted community, like, okay, I don't have to jump over the biggest hurdle first, right? Like I can start at a place that feels really safe and a little cocoon and like do that. And then I can like branch out and like, okay, what about if I do some, you know, talking over here with, you know, communities that I don't know everybody that's there. And now there's you know, writing and being on a podcast and like all these different levels, you've worked yourself up, you know, you've built yourself up in your capacity to be able to show up through taking those little steps. I think a lot of times we remain in silence because we have this feeling of like, I have to open it up to all people in all ways. Like it does just have to be this big thing, but we, I think this is an important lesson that you're sharing here with us today that we can take little steps that will grow and help us, you know, become bolder and more and more capa capable of sharing wherever, wherever we want. Yeah. yeah. And I think one of the other things that came up in this process was I was able to do, um, really assess the relationships I had mm -hmm. on how much trust is in this relationship. Yeah. Do these people really care about me? Not the me that they want to see, but the quirky, flawed, human, messy person that I am. Yeah. And um, what, what it did was I was able to invest more in the relationships that were built around real trust. Mm -hmm. And not, I, it didn't mean that I abandoned all other relationships. It was just that I knew that it's like, okay, this is my inner circle, you yeah, know, yeah. and these okay. other people are great too. And they're, they might be fun for brunch or whatever, but they're not my inner circle. That's it. Yeah. Oh my gosh. We talk about that so much in Beyond Surviving. <laughs> like, look, not everybody has to be your person. Not everybody has to be, you know, all the way invited in and you can have layers and different types of relationships and dynamics in those relationships. Yeah. That's beautiful. I love that for you. When you think a little bit about relationship, I know, you know, oftentimes just anybody who's experienced a sexual trauma um, has concerns about, can I really be in relationship? And, you know, when you add in this particular, you know, disorder, there are layers, there are complexities that it brings, like we don't have to shy away from that but it doesn't mean you're destined to be like single forever. <laughs> like, like you don't get to have love and connection and relationship. And maybe can you share with us a little bit about, I know you've talked a little bit already today about some of the, the relationships, but what's that been like for you to really come into being your whole self and being in relationship with someone? Yeah. And I think a lot of that, it's so also in, included in that is intimacy, right? Yeah. Um, and that is a complicated thing for survivors, you know, anyways. And I think, um, you know, it takes time um, and really, um, you know, being honest and, and clear with yourself about what feels good and what doesn't feel good, what feels safe, what doesn't feel safe. And learning and understanding the kinds of like what you want in a relationship and it's perfectly fine to be asexual mm -hmm. or aromantic. So um, you can have an incredibly intimate relationship. I, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I identify both as queer and lesbian. Um, but um, you know, all of those things are fine and you can find a wonderful loving person regardless of whatever your unique needs or uh, it, things that you uh, avoid. And a lot of it is just being able to 
um, have the ability to communicate what what you need and and what is not okay for you yeah and, you know for me I'm I'm like super clear it's like yes 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 no <laughs> <laughs> thank you yeah right yeah um, and then of course you know um we had checked in a little bit about you know gender identities for me yeah. Um, you know, my, most of my identities are female, but I do have some agender identities that don't show up in intimate situations. And that comes from, you know, doing some work um, mm -hmm. to be able to, you know, plan and prepare that way. But very often, um, there may be parts of yourself uh, for people who are DID that feel more confident, but are maybe not, don't, are, are not best for intimate relationships. And so really having those internal communications with the different parts of yourself to make sure that, that the right parts of you are showing up for the right jobs mm. is what I would say. Yeah. And, and everyone has, you know, like every, we, we joke about how you go back home and you immediately revert back to being a kid, right? Mm -hmm. You go to work, you've got a certain person. Right, yeah. These are all true. The biggest difference is that with DID, those different parts of me have different histories, different memories. Yeah. Um, and uh, different likes and dislikes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and really those are the primary differences. Mm. Yeah. Is there any part of you where you feel this is a superpower? Oh. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like, you know, I'm like I can imagine it being a drag <laughs> and like being a total like pain in the ass at times. But like, are there any aspects of this where you're like, damn, I'm so like this is dope, and I like I'm living it with this and in this, and it's creating something in my life that might not otherwise be there. Absolutely. I, I've always jokingly said that dissociation is my superpower. Mm -hmm. And I used to always jokingly say, and now it came true, is, you know, if if we ever end up in the zombie apocalypse, that I'm the person you want to have in your corner. Like yeah. I can survive anything. Got all the skill sets. <laughs> I got all the skills. Oh and, uh, and, you know, it's proved to be, you know, true that now that I'm in a place in my life where um, you know, I have a healthy relationship both with myself and with people in my circle. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I could be honest with myself and uh, about what I can and what I can't do mm -hmm. um, and what's not good for me and not doing things that are no longer good for me, setting healthier boundaries and also, um, you know, developing healthier relationships you know, within the people that I've always wanted to have in my life and bringing new people in my life that have those traits as well. Cheers to that. Fuck yeah, Killian. <laughs> <laughs> I love meeting badass people and hearing their stories and just seeing how you're out in the world just by being you creating and affecting change just in that, just in showing up as your authentic self. I think that's beautiful. The most beautiful thing any of us can do. And I just, you know, cheers you for that. And I love that you've been taking your journey and you've been crafting it into a, a story and into a book. And so um, tell us a little bit more about your book and where people are going to be able to find that. Well, thank you. Uh, so the book will be available on um, both my publisher's website, which is Nomadic Press. Um, and they're a small boutique uh, press that uh, they have a location there in, in Brooklyn, in Iowa, and Oakland. And so um, they're, um, they're nomadicpress.org. And my book is in cohort 2022. So there's 10 of us that um, have books coming out uh, in this month, February. And uh, you, you can order it through them directly, um, and it'll be available through local bookstores as well. 
Amazing, amazing. So I'll have the link in the title for the book here in our show notes for anybody who would like to go um, get a copy of that. You can also connect with uh, Kelly Ann at kellyannparkerpoetry.com. And I will have that link in the show notes as well so that you all can pop over and um, continue to connect. Any final thoughts as we start to wrap up today? Yes, what I can, um, first of all, thank you so much for having me here. Um, Thank you for doing what you do. I knew, like, I wanted to reach out to you right away uh, when I knew that I was going to have my book because I really wanted to talk about DID. um, And I knew this was going to be a great place to do it. But um, the thing that I really want to share with everyone is, you know, I know everyone says, journaling and, you know, all of that is important. Uh, But what I found is whether you identify as a poet or not, poetry is a wonderful way of uh, creating language that doesn't already exist to describe something that no one else can. Mm -hmm. And I encourage everyone, it's not about being bad, it's not about being good, you know, art, the the creation of art, of any form of art uh, is is for its own, you know, its own need and tapping into your creative side is, uh, you know, uh, tapping into the healing part of you, the part of your healing journey. And so I would encourage anyone, buy paint, paint badly, you know, (laughs) write poetry. Do it, just do it, yeah. Whatever it is, get your your thing out. Channel your inner three-year-old, right? Grab that three-year-old to just go for it. <laughs> they don't it's care. Painting, go Good. for it. <laughs> <laughs> That's all so good. Oh my gosh. Well, I just, again, I'm so appreciative of you. Thank you so much for being here, for sharing your story. You're such an inspiration. Really appreciate you. And, and thank you everybody for listening, for tuning in, for joining us today. As always, if you'd like to make a donation in support of the podcast, you can go to bit.ly slash beyond surviving podcast donation. All contributions will be applied towards funding scholarships, the running of donation-based and free programs, and making sure that those reaching out for support get what they need. Don't forget to visit rachelgrantcoaching.com to learn more about sexual abuse recovery coaching, and be sure to subscribe to this podcast. We have so much more to share. This is going to be a great year, y'all. You don't want to miss an episode, so click subscribe, and then come back next time, and until then take good care of you.